in the ICU uh, with COVID-19 at Baptist Memphis. That's uh, 113 uh, total, which is about what we've had for the last four or five days or so, down nicely off of our 152 peak. But uh, and actually the ICU numbers are down a bit, but unfortunately we've had several deaths among younger people in the ICU who had been in the ICU for quite some time on the, on very aggressive therapy. So uh, that's one of the real uh, real tragedies of the uh, of the Delta wave that we've seen as well. So the numbers are are stable over the last several days um, at Baptist DeSoto. I can tell you that there are 17 people in the intensive care unit um, uh, with COVID-19 and nine of those are on ventilators. Uh, I mentioned there are 38 people in the ICU at Memphis and 28 of those are on ventilators. So as we've said before, a lot of uh, technology personnel uh, going into the care of these patients right now, which uh, one of the side effects is that that is a large chunk of ICU capability that are taken up by COVID and therefore can't be used for other sorts of illnesses. We haven't had the degree of problem with that that some places around the country have, Louisiana being probably the largest example of that, but certainly it's something that we have to be very careful about uh, about every day. So those are the kind of limited numbers I have. We can have some more later uh, if we can uh, get those out to you as well, but happy to answer any questions anyone has. Hey, Dr. Threlkeld, it's Kelly with Channel 5. How are you? Hey, doing well. Thank you. Um, you know, you, you kind of mentioned when it comes to numbers, uh, you know, that, that things are backing off a little bit when it comes to hospitalizations, but you did mention, um, you know, that unfortunate news of, of the number of deaths. You know, I know that this is, you know, disturbing to think about, and I want to ask this with as much tact, you know, as possible, but over the last couple of weeks, uh, national data has shown um, here in Tennessee and Mississippi, hospitalizations leveling off or, you know, showing a, a dramatic decrease, but deaths going up. Is there any indication that, or have you seen at least in, in other parts of this pandemic, that these two trends follow each other? Yeah, I think it's it's been something that we have seen throughout the process. Um, I guess, unfortunately, in a lot of ways, you start kind of with the cases and then probably a couple of weeks after that, you get uh, a group of people who are sick enough, both through transmission around the town and through the development of more serious disease uh, when they get it. It takes about seven to 10 days um, to get really maximally ill from this and to get to a situation requiring hospitalization and, and worse, sometimes ICU care. And then deaths um, actually follow. Uh, and they follow longer now after the other numbers than we have seen in the past, simply because as I mentioned early on in the pandemic, a lot of the cases of hospitalizations were in 70, 80, 90 year old people, uh, and they tended not to survive very long when they got that ill in the ICU on ventilatory support and the like. Um, and it even sort of led to sort of an offshoot idea that being on the ventilator was harmful in and of itself. And that's not true. It's just being sick enough to need a ventilator was very harmful in itself. Uh, ventilators weren't causing any extra damage above and beyond the requirement and the necessity of that degree of almost to need them. Um, so we saw that situation. Now those curves have been decoupled a little bit more. Uh, certainly the hospitalization numbers follow uh, days to a couple of weeks after the increase in case numbers, but the death numbers are a bit harder to uh, to connect because with younger people, 20s, 30s, 40, w the ones we've lost in the last week or so have been in their uh, 30s, uh, occasionally younger. Um, and so those folks live a lot of times uh, for some time, given the aggressive care that we we're able to provide for them before they succumb to the illness. So we can see a separation of the cases uh, by several weeks uh, before uh, the actual unfortunate mortality rate catches up to that. So um, I think always throughout the pandemic, the most logical curve uh, to follow, the one that was closest to what the activity was uh, predictably in the community has been the hospitalization rate because cases are going to go up and down. Cases are going to vary uh, with how much people decide to get tested. Um, and we've seen in other studies that people who've been vaccinated now are more likely to go out and get tested uh, than folks who were not probably just because they tend to be more aggressive about their health care uh, to begin with. 
So we see variation in how we measure uh, the cases. We even see, uh, as probably was the case last year, last week, I should say here, uh, you'll see catch up. And so there'll be a few days where you don't get the reports, uh, but they all get reported from several days at the same time. We've seen that in several instances throughout the pandemic. So the number of cases can be dizzying to try to follow. And, and I very honestly don't pay as much attention to the daily rate of cases, certainly than I do the weekly rate. And even then, um, I think hospitalizations make better sense because whether you got tested or not, if you get sick enough to be in the hospital and you need oxygen and you can't breathe, that's a fairly reproducible number to measure, whether, uh, I mean, regardless of anything else that's going on. And then everybody coming into the hospital is tested. So we typically find out with a fair amount of accuracy um, what the real numbers are of cases. So again, hospitalized cases with COVID-19 and the ones that require ICU care, those are kind of things that you can come much closer to hanging your hat on in terms of accuracy. The death rate, uh, tragic though it is, can be very difficult to attach to those other two. And, and in our case, I think now are lagging significantly behind. Um, but it, but it's, it's, I mean, you mentioned that it's difficult, it is. I mean, you look at our when you look at our nurses, I, I just I looked over the weekend and and uh, and beginning this week, it, it's really incredibly difficult and something that I say again and again, but I think they just don't get enough credit. Um, it's hard on other members of the healthcare team, particularly nurses, but speech therapists and physical therapists, pharmacists, everybody. I don't want to name everybody because there's just so many. Um, you're talking about one in 500 people uh, in the United States now has died of COVID-19. And I thought about this over the weekend as I was looking at some of the September 11th, 2001 uh, coverage and documentaries uh, throughout that tragedy. And you saw things like uh, the most compelling and really tragic things I think that, that came across in those reviews were those phone calls that people made from the top floors of the, uh, of the building saying, I don't think I'm going to make it and saying goodbye to their families. What people need to understand is that these nurses that are taking care of people in the ICU, um, as compelling as those, uh, as those stories were, these nurses are making those phone calls every week. I mean, I asked a nurse, I said, how many times have you had to make a phone call for somebody who was about to be put on a ventilator with COVID with a significant likelihood of never talking to their family again, sometimes not getting an answer and having to help them leave a voice message, for gosh sake, um, to their family? Um, you know, that stuff leaves a mark. Um, and, and it's just happened all too much. And it's why healthcare workers, I think, are, are very tired and they're also frustrated people not getting vaccinated because when you see that that doesn't happen anymore to people who've been fully vaccinated it just becomes increasingly senseless uh, as they're looking at that in person it's it's uh, it's a very tough time for those folks sorry i went well beyond your uh, your question and <laughs> the answer no thank you thank you so much yeah hey dr thrillkeld it's corinne hi corinne how are you i'm doing all right um, so this Saturday is 18 months from our first confirmed COVID-19 case in Shelby County. Um, I think back then we thought this would be over maybe in a couple weeks to a couple months. Now here we are a year and a half in. Wh where do we go from here? And what are your takeaways on the past 18 months? Um, boy, you thought I went over on the last one. Um, I think... Um, you know, it's just tragic in, so, in too many ways to really even to, to even cover. Yeah, we thought that this would not be uh, what it is today. I think that most people, um, and well, let me just say the scope of it. I mean, I mentioned a minute ago that one in 500 people in the United States have died of COVID-19, an extraordinary number. Um, and, and I thought about it as I looked at that number yesterday, I said, if, if you were to take, throw a football game at the Liberty Bowl and pack it with, I guess it's somewhere around 65,000, if I remember correctly, um, and say, okay, we're gonna have this game and, and 130 of you aren't gonna make it home, sorry. Um, uh, people would probably not go. Um, and even if you wanna say, okay, we're gonna pick the, the first 30 or 40 of those 130 are gonna be elderly. Uh, and then there'll be people who have other problems, overweight, diabetic, but, but some of them are just going to be chosen at random. Um, you'd have a hard time getting people to show up. But in fact, we are buying tickets to that game every day that we have people that don't protect themselves uh, with the vaccine because uh, the vaccine is a free pass to, to get out of that stadium uh, as, as things are looking right now. So I think that I think it is time when you're talking about 18 months and that degree of death for people to look back and reflect and see what's happened, look and see what the data have shown us and, and what is the correct course of action and behavior to, to try to get us out of it. And then when you take it from there, what's going to happen based on that? Well, I think most people now are suggesting that we're going to reach sort of a system of, of uh, endemic 
uh, virus, that this virus is likely at least to become like the other four circulating coronaviruses currently in that they cause common colds and more minor illnesses. They may have been serious pandemics hundreds of years ago. We're, we're just not sure. But it's not likely to go the way of a smallpox uh, to be vaccinated out of existence. I mean, in fact, smallpox took from 1791 or two on to 1977 for the last natural case after vaccines started. So uh, even then, that would be a, a, a difficult route. But I think most people would think that what's going to happen is that over time, this virus is going to become, uh, given the fact that there may be other variants that, that, that extend its virulence and the problem for us, but over time, it's likely to show more immunity in our population, to be less severe, and there'll be fewer and fewer people eligible to get this and die based on their immunity. Yes, there will be reinfections. Uh, we see that in the coronaviruses that are circulating now. You can get those coronaviruses every two or three years in some cases, but they tend to cause nuisance illness uh, in that regard. And um, so we're likely to get to a, to a virus that circulates more in children who are as yet unvaccinated, probably doesn't make too many of them very sick, even as we see now and then over time, both with maybe continued vaccinations and maybe just with uh, ongoing immunity, uh, this virus will probably become less and less severe and will become one of those things that society just tolerates, much like uh, the flu. And some people don't bother to get their flu vaccine, yet it kills 30,000 plus people a year in the United States. We have sort of deemed that acceptable, I guess. And I think we're probably going to get to something like that with uh, COVID-19. Um, but, but I think that that doesn't mean there aren't millions of people right now in the United States still to protect. And if we don't get people vaccinated, to hurry that process up, to get it to more of a nuisance situation, uh, then there are just too many people left still to die. Even if not many people who get infected die, obviously plenty uh, are dying. Um, and just the fact that it's a low percentage death rate uh, when you have as many cases as we have had in this country, you're going to have a lot of deaths. Now, that number will be gradually shrinking, both through natural immunity from infection uh, and, of course, through the immunity from vaccinations. And so we hope that the combination of those things, hopefully both and people who've had the infection, will speed that process to where we move toward that more nuisance status of this virus and away from something that, that is uh, still killing people. Um, I think that probably the, the one thing that's going to be uh, difficult is that we're, we may move from a situation of more contagious virus winning, and it's something we've talked about before, into a more resistant virus winning. Uh, that is to say that as more people have immunity to Delta or have either been vaccinated or infected by it, they'll be less likely to get reinfected, less likely to get sick from it. Um, and it may be that the next variant down the road, whether it's mu or one of the other, um, other variants that we haven't seen yet, those viruses will probably get the upper hand at circulating in the population by getting resistant to our immunity. We hope that there's limited capacity for the virus to, in fact, gain that resistance. Uh, we certainly hope that. What we don't know is whether a gamma can make a return or one of these other variants can actually overcome our vaccine immunity and take us back to square one needing another vaccine. I don't really expect that is going to happen, but the last thing I'm going to do now is be overconfident about something that, as you mentioned, we thought would last a few weeks and now has killed 660,000 Americans uh, and still is with us. So I think that's the direction that we're going. We just want it to happen sooner, both to spare those lives and to get people back to a normal life, uh, get our elderly population able to circulate in the community again uh, in their older years our kids back to school and not having to shut the schools down. So there are just so many things that have happened that are tragic, all of which can be ameliorated or even almost eliminated if we can get everybody vaccinated uh, and move this thing quicker to that sort of more nuisance status than, than, than what we have seen, which is more of a life-threatening problem. Dr. Threll, Kellis Brandon with Channel 5. Can you um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about how access to monoclonal antibody therapy may be changing and how that will affect access um, here in the Mid-South for treatment? Yeah, and, and so, I mean, I can say just from personal backdrop, we, we actually, uh, as I've said on a few occasions in the past, we actually built negative pressure rooms in our infusion center where I'm sitting right now in order to be able to give the first monoclonal antibody infusion at 8 a.m. the first day it was available in the United States. And so we literally were some of the first people to give it in the country. Um, I believe in those monoclonal antibodies. I think it really does cut down on the severity of illness, hospitalization, and deaths. 
uh, by a significant amount. We've, uh, we, when I can't take it anecdotally, I've certainly had a number of people who, who felt a lot better afterwards, but that some of that may be placebo, but I think the numbers do show uh, that it really does help. And so we certainly believe in giving it. We've given, I guess, probably close to 7,000 or more um, uh, monoclonal antibody doses in the Baptist system right now, uh, and a lot of other others as well around the community. So I think it's a very important therapy. Um, there is a new sort of political uh, um, argument hatching right now, and that is that people in the southern United States have not been as vaccinated uh, as other parts of the country for a variety of reasons. And so there's been some discussion on the federal level potentially to limit monoclonal antibody because the perception was that governors in this part of the uh, of, in this part of the country were not pushing vaccinations and masks and other sort of ameliorating behaviors and instead falling back on the more expensive federally funded uh, monoclonal antibody therapies um and so this is why I would never want to be a politician and have no inclination to be that because those are questions that I, as a physician, don't really want to wade into because our job as healthcare workers is to treat the person in front of us, no matter where who they are or where they're from or what their behavior is. It is not our job to decide who deserves to get better and who does not. And so, uh, but I, I will certainly uh, realize that it's a terrible mistake to use these monoclonal antibodies as a fallback instead of pushing the proper behaviors to eliminate the infections altogether. I get that. If you're in Montana uh, and, uh, you know, and all the vaccines had been taken up by Tennessee, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, when the, vac when the viral surge reaches Montana, uh, then that's a problem if there really is a shortage of these medicines. Uh, as of now, there hasn't been a critical shortage, but they're trying to ramp up that production. Again, at the same time, as a physician, uh, we're trying to take care of whoever we see in front of us. So, so I think that this is going to be a question that's that's played out on the political stage over the next few weeks, and I hope that we can uh, reach something of a compromise on that because we don't want to limit monoclonal antibody use to anyone. Um, at the same time, I think it's important uh, that we act responsibly as states, as individuals in these states to get our vaccinations and not use those monoclonal, antib monoclonal antibodies as some sort of fallback therapy because we didn't bother to do the things to prevent the infection in the first place. Further, seeing a fair amount of people that were giving this monoclonal antibody to who had been uh, vaccinated. So there's that. I mean, the older patient, you get someone in their 80s who are at risk by virtue of their age alone uh, for more severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Uh, if they've been vaccinated, at first, we sort of said, you know, uh, it may not be that important to get the monoclonal antibody therapy if you had been vaccinated, because we think your protection against severe disease is substantial. I still think it's substantial, but at the edges of this equation, the elderly, certainly someone immunocompromised, that might be a person that would need the monoclonal antibody despite previous vaccinations. And so that further complicates the idea of how you would limit these doses in any way. So I certainly hope that there will be an adequate supply. That's the solution to be able to give anyone who needs it. Uh, because when you start talking about uh, dividing people up into who deserves it and who does not, that gets to be a very, uh, a very tenuous sort of reasoning. And I just hope that we have adequate supply so that that sort of thing doesn't have to come up. Thank you. And I also had a quick question about boosters. Why is there such, I don't even know what to call it, such um, conflicting information about whether we are going to need boosters? Yeah, it, it's it's an increasingly loud discussion and argument right now. It's, it's really, it's a very interesting, if it weren't so important, it would be interesting uh, question. Um, there are a lot of people out there getting boosters now. I mean, I get phone calls uh, by the fair number every single day says, have you gotten your booster? And, uh, you know, my brother got his and I'm about to get mine. For the record, I have not gotten my booster. Um, number one, it's kind of against the law to do it right now. Theoretically, unless you're immunosuppressed, and I'm not, um, that's the group that has been approved for the booster or third dose of the RNA vaccine. Why? Because those people have been shown in fairly large number not to generate an adequate immune response in the first place with their two shots. Now, not everybody gets an adequate one with a third either, but some did. And so the decision was made to approve that third shot in people who are immune suppressed. You can go get that today. Theoretically, you're not supposed to be able to go get that third shot unless you're in one of those groups. Now, you can go and say you're immunosuppressed and nobody's going to challenge you about that because that's it really can't be done on any meaningful logistical basis by the people who are giving the shots. 
but but theoretically, a, a, a pharmacy or a hospital or whatever who is just giving out shots to people who are not suppressed would be at risk of losing their capability with the FDA of giving emergency use authorization agents by that. So it's a bit uh, it's a bit unusual just to be able to get it even right now. But in terms of whether we should get it, whether we need it, um, that is all, all by itself a very interesting problem. If you look at the data that have come in from Israel, they would suggest that indeed the effectiveness of two shots is beginning to dwindle a bit. And so they're seeing more breakthroughs uh, than they were seeing before. Now, we saw that from Delta all by itself. So was that because the vaccine was waning or just because of Delta? So there's another issue that's hard necessarily to tease out. But we were seeing, saying weeks ago that I had seen more breakthrough infections with Delta than I had seen cumulatively during the months prior to the really uh, to the entree of, of Delta in our community. So we certainly seeing more breakthroughs. But with the Israeli data, data, they found they were seeing more even significant or serious breakthroughs. And they found that in giving a third shot to people over 50, they cut down those breakthroughs by a significant amount. So when you get down to the question is, what are we really aiming to by these boosters? Are we aiming to stop serious disease or are we aiming to stop breakthrough infections that might be minimally symptomatic to asymptomatic? And that's a that's a more complicated question in and of itself. I don't want to keep dividing the questions out, but the more serious disease obviously is job one. We don't want people to be hospitalized and dying uh, because the vaccine is waning. Um, but the problem is that there aren't very good data yet to show that the vaccine has waned that much. I mean, you still look at the hospitals. We say again and again, essentially everybody dying in these hospitals is unvaccinated. Uh, I had one uh, gentleman in his 80s to die who was fully vaccinated, um, been vaccinated early on, but there aren't many. Uh, it, it happens, but it's extremely rare. Um, and so in that sense, it, it's very effective still is the vaccine against preventing the worst manifestations of this illness. It probably is dripping down, if we believe the Israeli data and some observations here, at protecting us from asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infections. And we know that those can be transmitted to other people, particularly unvaccinated and totally unprotected people. So that all by itself is an important second goal. It's probably not appropriate just to worry about hospitalizations and mortalities, because just passing the virus along through the community and keeping that process going is going to stoke the fire and continue to have problems with schools and uh, you know, potentially cases and overburdening medical facilities. So we want to st cut down on cases altogether, though that's obviously a slightly secondary goal. So all these things are fairly controversial. So we don't know whether a third shot is going to have a whole lot of help at preventing the most serious aspects of the infection because it's already pretty good. Uh, and the data that it would cut down on mild infections is very sp or very sparse. And so that's what we're seeing argued right now in the FDA. And there are members who have had some heated arguments about that. Experts are divided about whether or not you would have a big impact by adding a third shot to that equation in preventing the mild to the moderate illness. Um, and one final point, I think this is another great example of how our communication about these factors in, I mean, about the entire pandemic uh, have not always been terribly helpful. I mean, what happened? We had the, uh, we had all of our government agencies saying on one day that we don't need any vaccine third dose. We're fine with two. Everything is going well. And then within a couple of days, the message changed to, but uh, we need a third dose. And it's going to happen on September the 20th in people who have been eight months removed from their second dose. Uh, and then maybe it went to six months. And so we got all this variability. What the message should have been, I think, is from the CDC, from the FDA, from, from the White House, from everybody, should have been, you know what, um, we're seeing some data from Israel and maybe some data from the U.S. that the vaccine efficacy that we've been so proud of and so happy with may be waning a bit. Um, it's early, but we're starting to kind of worry that we might need a third vaccine or a booster, however you want to refer to it, and we're looking at that very carefully. It's too early for us to say exactly when that should be. Stay tuned. We're going to filter through more data very quickly over the next days to weeks and decide you know, for sure that we need one and exactly when it should be. That should have been the message because I think that would have been better taken by the populace of the U.S. and other places as it as it came out, it appeared to be sort of harem scarum and uh, sort of changing information when really I think the data behind it are just slow in coming. And, and again, that's science. It's an incremental thing. We found out that there was some data that suggested that maybe the vaccine efficacy is going to wane over time. Uh, the question is, is it going to wane from 
a few more uh, minor cases into more severe cases. That's the concern. That clearly is the concern of Dr. Fauci and other people that we're starting to see that in Israel. But there's some debate about that still. So it's a very, very complicated situation. And I think it's far from a foregone conclusion exactly what the FDA committee is going to do when they meet on Friday to discuss this. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? Dr. Yeah. can you talk about what constitutes a breakthrough infection? What does that really mean? Yeah, so um, so in general, that's been sort of difficult to uh, to hold on to as well. In, in general, people are calling breakthrough infections infections in people who uh, who have been fully vaccinated. And we know that with Delta, uh, one vaccine with the RNA vaccine uh, is not adequate. Um, and so it really needs to be a couple of weeks after the second vaccine is what we really call breakthrough. There have been countless cases, and I mean, uh, including fatal cases of people who have gotten the infection just after getting their first vaccine or between their first and their second vaccines. It is clear that that is inadequate to protect people from uh, certainly from minor infections and even from the most severe form of it. So we're really talking about people who have been fully vaccinated. And it's harder really to use those data because, you know, the FDA and others decided not to keep track of breakthrough cases that weren't severe enough to get hospitalized. Uh, and I, I have no problem with that. Um, it just turns out that those are data that you can't use later on. So uh, breakthrough cases are a little hard to get our fingers around it looking at numbers. Further, uh, just as an offshoot of that, it's hard to compare those to people who have had the infection in the past and our breakthrough, if you will, from the natural immunity rather than the vaccine immunity. That's hard because a lot of those cases in the past have been asymptomatic to minimally symptomatic. A lot of people didn't know they had been infected. And we don't, as a matter of just routine course, test for nucleocapsid antibody to always demonstrate that people have been infected naturally in the past because frankly it doesn't change anything that we do. So we don't typically go around doing things in the hospital to add cost and complexity to care unless it's going to make a difference for that patient. Um, so, th so those are numbers that are sometimes hard to get accurate uh, data for. Um, that's what they are, uh, but exactly what to do with them I think still uh, remains a bit up in the air. The problem is, of course, that there are more breakthroughs with Delta in the first place, uh, in part because the vaccines are not as effective uh, in longer term with, uh, from Delta from preventing the mild breakthroughs. Still quite effective, very effective at preventing the most serious forms of the disease, uh, even from Delta. But for the minor stuff, uh, we see a lot more of it um, with the Delta variant uh, as, as a breakthrough. So that sort of complicates the data as well. Just adding a couple of questions from the feed, if time allows. Um, Mary Frances Anthony asks, how many of the unvaccinated admissions have had a documented case of COVID? Well, I sort of just answered that by accident a minute ago. Uh, we don't really know. Um, we certainly, um, I mean, there are a lot of people who've been, uh, had COVID that weren't documented. Uh, the most important way I can answer that question, I think, is that there are several that I can think of, a couple in the hospital right now who are critically ill, who have had COVID in the past and felt it was okay not to get the vaccine because their natural immunity was terrific. I would point out that I love natural immunity. I'm an immunologist. I think it's one of the most amazing things in the known universe, our immune system. But people die of infections all day, every day, because our immunity isn't good enough on many occasions. So uh, we have pretty good data to suggest that you can still die having had the infection before. We also have good data to say that if you get vaccinated on top of your actual case of COVID in the past, you will protect yourself 2.3 is one of the CDC studies, but probably at least twice as protected to get the vaccine on top of that. So why wouldn't we do that? It's a very, very frequent question that I'm asked. And I think there are a lot of people out there that are putting themselves at, uh, at risk uh, because they don't take advantage of that. Is natural immunity good? Yeah, it probably is. It may even be, according, of course, obviously to the Israeli study, uh, better than vaccine immunity as we stand there. But one thing is clear, no matter who you are, previously infected or not, you stand to gain tremendously, at least twofold, and of course a lot more than that if you're uninfected in the past, by getting the vaccine. So a very, very important uh, point to uh, to uh, to ask. So appreciate that question. Um, Samuel Pickle 
uh, can pronounce the last name, sorry. Why are some doctors against the vaccine and others push it? I think if all medical professions, professionals were on the same page, people would be more comfortable getting the shot. It's concerning that you have some saying, do not get it. Um, a very, uh, very important problem, I agree. Um, some physicians uh, say, I'm afraid of the vaccine, I wouldn't get it. Um, I would tell you that if you look at infectious disease physicians, uh, I don't know of anyone who says that. Um, a pulmonologist, don't know of anybody who says that. Uh, those are the people who deal with immunology, particularly of the lungs, of critical illness the most. Uh, there are a number of other uh, terrific specialties that, that help us with all of the, uh, the COVID-19 patients. But I would tell you that of the people that, that are supposed to know the most about this, uh, almost to a person, uh, they would support the vaccine. So um, I, I could go into a lot of specifics. I've seen a lot of people give advice to their patients that was very poor, in my opinion. Most of it very easy to argue against. If, if I can get a one on one time with that person. So I would suggest, obviously, that you get a couple of opinions about that um, at the very least uh, and ones that you trust, certainly. Uh, but that does, I agree, cause a fair amount of uh, confusion when some physicians uh, either don't believe in the vaccine. Uh, that can be a, a big problem for us. No question. Um, Brian Tipler asks, how many people who've had COVID then got fully vaccinated and then got COVID again? That is a number that I would like to know. So people who had COVID, then got vaccinated, then got COVID again. So a great question. That's what you see as the most protected individual in every study that I know of. Even the Israeli study that says, uh, you know, natural immunity is very good in their study, but they said obviously that if you, the best protected is someone who's been infected and then vaccinated on top of that. I don't know the number. I'm not sure that we have great numbers about that, um, but they're pretty darn good shape, uh, those people are, who've had both in terms of protection. So that's where you would wanna be. Obviously, you would never go out and get infected to provide yourself protection against the infection you're trying to avoid, but if you've had it before and get vaccinated, that's about as good a spot as you can be in, I think. Um, Ashley Ludlow asked, would you recommend those who've had COVID get vac Would you recommend those who have had COVID get vaccinated and why? That's the same question that we just uh, that we just dealt with. Obviously, it's a very popular and common question. And I think an extremely important one. Um, Sam Smith asked, we were told last year that the heat of summer would kill the virus. What happened? Every day we hear something different. Someone is making a lot of money. Um, <laughs> Well, I, it's not it's not me, uh, Sam. I would tell you. Um, so, um, so there are two parts of that. Um, I think we dealt already with we're hearing something different but in terms of the heat of the summer. I would argue that the heat of the summer last summer did make it go away. I've said many times that we asked the question, why didn't the virus go away? And at the time, I remember very distinctly, it was a tough question. I said, maybe it did go away. Maybe this is really good compared to what we're going to see in the winter. And certainly that's what happened. We had a dramatic upsurge after we got inside and colder weather came. We are certainly hoping, hoping that that won't happen again this time. Um, it is certainly likely that it will, there will be a tendency toward increased cases and increased transmission as we move into the colder weather. We just hope that we'll knock this thing down enough with, uh, you know, with behaviors and with uh, vaccines that it won't happen. I mean, I emphasize that we got our numbers just to look at hospitalizations down to 10 from 172 before Delta hit, and now we were back to 152 at this peak. So we should never be completely comfortable. We should certainly try to do those things until you get to a point where it's gone. Um, it, it's going to be something that makes us uh, very nervous along the way. Um, a couple of other questions. Megan Riley asked, um, lupus patients and the vaccine, do you recommend? Uh, my answer would be a nearly uh, categorical uh, yes. Um, I think that people who have autoimmune diseases in general, if you look at the American uh, Rheumatologic Society, which is sort of the advisory group for those types of diseases in general, and lupus in particular, uh, they would suggest that those folks with those diseases, particularly those on therapies for those diseases with immunosuppressive medications, are at particular risk for severe COVID and death from COVID. So those folks would be the very ones that you would want to vaccinate. There are also little to no um, data that suggests that they are at increased risk for vaccine side effects. Uh, they just don't have any additional problems compared to the rest of us. So as is usually the case with these sorts of concerns and even sometimes becoming rumors on the internet, the very people that are the shyest about taking the vaccine because of concerns that have been expressed to them by other people, pregnant people, autoimmune disease, that sort of thing, are the very people that have the most to gain by getting it and the most to lose by not getting it. So a very important question uh, always. Um, 
Deanna Guidi. Sesti asked, we had antibodies last week at Baptist South Haven. How long do we wait till getting the flu shot? Because if that means monoclonal antibody, that's sort of interesting. You certainly want to wait 90 days after the monoclonal antibody for um, for coronavirus before you get a vaccine because those monoclonal antibodies hanging around may attach to the pieces of, uh, of the protein that we're making as a vaccine and keep our immune system from seeing them and therefore dampen our immune reaction. So we wait for those monoclonal antibodies to disappear before we vaccinate people for coronavirus. Should not really make any effect, however, on the flu shot. So that should not be a factor in getting your flu shot. Further, I hear a lot, should we separate the coronavirus and the flu vaccines? And the answer is we don't have to. When the, when the coronavirus vaccine first came out, people didn't want any confusion over side effects from the COVID vaccine and other types of vaccines. So it was recommended that those vaccines be separated by two weeks. That was under no circumstances a concern that it would affect the, um, you know, the well, the efficacy would affect the, how well the vaccine works. It was just a matter really of bookkeeping to make sure that we were able to count uh, side effects and the like properly. So it's fine to get a flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine at the same time. Um, Cynthia Kellum, uh, when do you suggest a healthy 65 or 70 year old to get a booster after being vaccinated? Uh, that goes back to the a question earlier. We really don't have any recommendation for an otherwise healthy non-immunosuppressed uh, even elderly person to get the vaccine booster yet, but I think obviously they're meeting Friday for the FDA, so that will uh, that will come out uh, further. People say which to get, which vaccine if you want to get a booster. Again, with the caveat that they're not approved yet. Uh, right now, uh, Pfizer is looking to give the same dose. Uh, Moderna is actually looking at potentially a half dose for the booster. Uh, if it gets approved. So all those things are actually still sort of in flux right now, but I think a lot of activity will come out, will be coming out on that in the next few days. Um, and then finally, um, Isaac Kike uh, comments, maybe the breakthrough cases are from early vaccines. I think that's pre precisely correct. Um, the idea that the Israeli data showed that folks who were vaccinated later on, April, May, uh, had a lower breakthrough infection rate than those who were vaccinated in January and February. So I think that's exactly the concern that we have. And it's why, in general, um, some, of the, uh, some of the folks uh, at the Fed have said, uh, we want to start this for people who've had the vaccine X number of months out. That number started at eight, um, but actually the Israelis are doing it with a little bit lower duration. So something that will be, I think, a lot of discussion on that over the next uh, few days to a couple of weeks. And that's all I've got from the feed. Thanks for your questions. I appreciate that. Any other questions I can answer? Okay, thanks. Have a great weekend, guys.